what's up? Welcome back to Nick Geo. If you saw my first video in Norway, thank you so much. If you have not, feel free to check it out right now. Today we're going to go to the other side of the Eurasian continent and take a look at Japan. Americans in particular seem to be pretty fascinated with Japan, probably because of the games, anime, and the cars. So why don't we take a look at 50 things that I thought were worth talking about in Japan. Japan has a massive public transportation system in terms of rails and highways. The Shinkansen bullet train reaches nearly 200 miles per hour with nine different rails that cover the majority of the entire island. It also connects Tokyo to Osaka. These larger rails integrate well with the smaller rails, including the semi-fast trains and the ones that make a bunch of local stops. Okino Torishima is sometimes considered an island in Japan, although it better fits the definition of an atoll. It's basically a man-made cement structure surrounded by coral reef. There are also a couple of helipads. Now, let's really kick things in gear by talking about Japan's three premier historic castles. The Matsumoto Castle is located in the city with the same name and it is easy to reach from the country's capital, Tokyo. Some like to refer to this one as the Crow Castle due to its black exterior. It's been preserved pretty well considering that it was built in 1594, although there are structures and things about it that would suggest the construction went back even further. In 1872, the Meiji government ordered the destruction of all of the feudal structures. However, this one was saved because it was met with massive protests. Between its geographic advantage, stone walls, moats, and numerous watchtowers, it's considered the most defensible castle in the country. Today, the second floor features a gun museum called Tepogura, displaying a collection of armor and weapons. Another one is the Nagoya Castle, also in the city of the same name. This one dates back to 1609, roughly being built by the Tokugawa Shogun. This was the country's largest one until it met a fatal impact during World War II. It's known for its adorned tiger-headed dolphins situated at the top, and the inside is also a museum focusing on samurai armor and treasure with other historical Japanese highlights. And that brings us to the Osaka Castle, which is located in, you guessed it, the city of the same name. This dates back to the 1500s, being built by a samurai warlord with the intent to flex some power. Damn, I'd say he did a pretty good job. Considering that this one had also been destroyed and rebuilt from war, it currently reflects the 17th century style with stone walls that still surround the original gates and towers. All right, so let's talk about the Japanese language. I owe this one to geography now. Thank you, Barbs. Basically, it uses three alphabets, the hiragana, katakana, and kanji. Hiragana and katakana are made up of 46 characters that correspond and give two characters to each syllable, similar to how we do it in the English language. Kanji, however, is a borrowed list of characters from China, and more than 2,000 of them are learned by most students. Now, we gotta talk about the super tall Tokyo Sky Tree. At 634 meters high, this height was reached just one week after the giant earthquake that hit Japan in 2011. It's taken over the function as a radio tower for Tokyo, and it has a plethora of other tourist attractions. These include the Salamachi Aquarium, as well as plenty of restaurants that give a very beautiful view of the entire city of Tokyo. Japan is further north, south, east, and west than the entire Korean peninsula. Now this doesn't really catch anybody as surprising until you mention west. That's because the Yayama Archipelago extends further west than people realize. Its westernmost island is known as Tonaguni, which is located pretty close to Taiwan. Spots of interest here include the Tofu Rock, the gorgeous Nara Falls, and Ida Beach. Hey, speaking of islands, the Tashirajima Island is located on the west side of Japan, known as the Island of Cats. This dates back to the Edo period in 1602, when all pet cats were free to help combat the rodent problem as they caused issues for the silkworm that were being raised. Another one is the small Kuroshima Island. These days it's heavily utilized for research centers, although there are still quite a few old shrines of worship. There's also the Kuroshima Lighthouse, however, it's more or less just a pole with the light on top of it. I guess that's kind of what lighthouses are, but you know what I mean. Oh, and apparently the rocks are very sharp, so if you go here, do be careful. Agashima Island is basically a volcanic crater, serving as a good spot to get away from everybody, as it's not really touched by tourists. It has a large, bowl-type shape from walls coming out of the ocean and dropping inward. This also makes for an incredible spot for stargazing at night. Japan is made up of about 6,800 islands, but four main ones make up most of the country's land mass. They are Hokkaido, Honshu, Shikoku, and Kyusha. We're going to return to Osaka, one of the very large cities in Japan. Something that I found to be pretty interesting is that this is home to the world's largest tomb. And a quick note, the pyramids of Giza are taller, but in terms of surface area, these are larger. This is the tomb of Emperor Nintoku, measuring 486 meters in length and 35 in height. Shaped as a keyhole, the entire site takes about an hour to walk around and is surrounded by three moats. 
Emperor Nintoka was the 16th Emperor of Japan ruling in the 4th century. Sometimes he's referred to as Saint Emperor as he was known for all of his goodness. This is considered by tradition, however, as the first historically verifiable emperor was Emperor Kinmai, the 29th Emperor in the 6th century. Emperor Kinmai is widely considered to have kicked off the beginning of the Asuka period of Yamato, Japan. Many associate this with the introduction of Buddhism to Japan, citing the bronze statue of Buddha that was gifted to the emperor from Song Myung, king of one of the three Korean kingdoms. He died in 571, but it's kind of disputed about where he was buried. There is a Shinto shrine at Nara designated as a mausoleum to him. Nara was actually the capital of Japan from 710 to 794. Recently it's become a big tourist destination due to how much traditional culture is shown in the city. There are a plethora of Buddhist temples here, including the Toshadai-ji and Sadai-ji, along with some Shinto shrines like the Kasuga Shrine. Oh, and this is also where the former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe was assassinated and killed in 2022. Shinzo Abe is Japan's longest serving Prime Minister, serving for a year in 2006, and again from 2012 until 2020. His maternal grandfather, Nobusuke Kishi, held high power during the occupation of Manchuria, which was renamed Manchuko during the occupation, before World War II, so he was born into politics. This makes him a rather controversial figure, especially considering he denies a lot of the atrocities that happened during the Japanese Empire. Whoa, stop a minute. Just putting a little disclaimer here that, yes, we are going to talk about some controversial things. This is not meant to dehumanize the people of Japan or anything of the sort, because every country has its history. I live in America. I know what it's like to have a long history of war crimes and meddling and racial issues. I just want to put it out there that that's not the intent of this video, just to shed some light on some things and some of those things might not be that pleasant. Okay, anyway, back to it. Speaking of American war crimes, I'm pretty sure we're all familiar with Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So, we're going to talk about some World War II stuff. Things are going to get a little dark here for a minute, so you've been warned. After the Japanese Empire had complete control over the Korean Peninsula, they started viewing Koreans as subhuman. They began replacing their traditions, their religions, and even their languages with Japanese ones. Forced labor around mining and farming built up what was known as the Empire of the Rising Sun. This involved relocating a fraction of the Korean population. Up to 200,000 women were forced into sexual slavery, which were known as comfort women for the military this would all continue up until the end of World War II. I wish it stopped there, but they also had something known as Unit 731 in China, which was basically a human experimentation project started by the Japanese in 1937. The purpose of this was to aid the Japanese military in seeing how much the body could withstand, you know, in terms of hunger or pain or even disease. Oh, and sexual experiments absolutely took place too. This was conducted on prisoners of war, primarily Chinese, Russian, Korean, and Mongol. Nobody was really punished for their crimes in this. When it became obvious that the Empire was going to lose the war, they began destroying their archives. Therefore, little is known about the scientists that partook in this. So, let's talk about how that unfolded. In August of 1945, Emperor Hirohito announced Japanese surrender following the proposed Operation Downfall, an Allied invasion. At what was known as the Alta Conference, Joseph Stalin promised entry into the Japanese war upon defeating Germany, leading to the invasion of Manchuria, Inner Mongolia, and Northern Korea to defeat the Kwantung Army. Unfortunately, the first U.S. atom bomb was dropped on Hiroshima a day before the Soviets could actually make this move. Kind of makes you wonder, huh? Okay, now stick with me, we're almost out of the controversial stuff. There's an organization in Japan known as Chongryon, headquartered in Chiyoda, Tokyo, which has close ties to the DPRK, or North Korea. It's primarily descendants of those who migrated during the Japanese occupation of Korea, many of whom were conscripted laborers and sexual slaves. This was founded in 1955 by Han Duk-su, a left-wing activist for labor movements in Japan. Much of the purpose was to organize around the DPRK, working towards peaceful reunification as well as fighting against suppression of Korean culture, language, education, and beliefs during the Japanese Empire. Many Koreans in Japan today still face relentless racial discrimination to the degree of Korea University students not getting government relief during times of struggle. This facility has also been attacked by Japanese authorities and right-wing activists, including a van opening fire on it in 2018. Moving on to a far warmer subject, Japan does have its fair share of musical artists and influences. For one, Yoko Ono is born here. And there's also the Japanese heavy metal outfit from the 80s called Loudness, one that I like. But everybody these days seems to love J-pop. J-pop, or Japanese pop, is basically exactly what it sounds like, music that takes influence from the Western styles of pop and rock and are from Japan. Its focus combines traditional Japanese influence of Kayo Kyoku with rock and pop outfits of the 20th century and recently the 21st century. Some of the earlier artists of the style include Yellow Magic Orchestra and Pink Lady and more modern ones picked up with the likes of BZ's, BB Queens, Glay, and AKB48. 
Now looking at Japanese folk music, one style that comes to mind is minyo. This tends to consist of a three-string lute, taiko drums, and a shakuhachi bamboo flute, all accompanied by singers. Lyrics typically focus around workers, especially fishermen and farmers, but religious and celebratory themes are also rather common in this style. So, when it comes to Japanese food, a lot of Americans in particular are going to think about ramen and sushi. Well, there's a little bit more to it than that. Some dishes include takoyaki, which is basically fried octopus balls. Balls of fried octopus, not like an octopus. Well, yeah, you get it. Tamagoyaki, which is folded fried eggs whipped with miran, sugar, and soy sauce. And for the thrill seekers, there's fugu, which can kill you, thus must be prepared by a licensed chef. It's basically blowfish, which has toxins that cause paralysis followed by death, so a trained chef must spend a few years learning how to properly extract the toxins. The longest and widest river in Japan is the Shinano River, running in the northeastern Honshu Island. At 367 kilometers, it's always been an effective means of transports to the Nutaru, Niigata, and Kambara ports. Mount Kobushi in the Japanese Alps is where this all takes its origin. Hot springs exist in the upper reaches of this river called Chikuma. Along with this is a plethora of ski resorts, many of which people will travel to for that and other wintertime sports. Now, let's discuss the era of the samurai, a completely different era for Japan. The samurai originated in the Heian period from 710 to 1185 AD and lasted all the way until the mid 19th century. They started out as warriors hired by private landowners, which were basically to protect them from other landowners and central feudal governments. These armies would eventually battle each other for control of the country. Minamato Yoritimo arose as the first victorious landowning clan, establishing a military government led by a shogun or a military commander. As the centuries went on, skilled martial arts became less needed as bureaucrats, artists, and teachers took on more important roles following the more peaceful eras. This would weaken the feudal rulers, causing the abolition of the samurai classes in the 19th century before the dawn of the Japanese Empire, which the samurai quite literally fought to the death against. Emperor Meiji would take over as the imperial ruler in 18. 68, which is where the term Meiji Restoration comes from. Certain samurai preserves still exist, such as the Takahashi Old Town. Developed from the base of the Bichu Matsuyama Castle, you can find surrounding samurai merchant houses still preserved as well as some old temples. Speaking of the Bichu Matsuyama Castle, it is the oldest standing castle in Japan among the other 11 that survived the post-feudal age. It was built on a steep mountain in 1240 AD with the aim of making it difficult to attack, reaching an elevation of 430 meters. Even today, it's pretty tough to access and require a lot of hiking to reach. But before moving on from the samurai, we gotta talk about the Battle of Shirayama. This was that battle I mentioned earlier that was them quite literally fighting to the death. The Satsuma Rebellion fought Yamagata's imperial forces until 1877, almost nine years after he took control, which was basically an uprising against the newly established Japanese Empire. This rebellion was led by Saigo Takamori on the island of Kyusha before being surrounded. With roughly 400 men left, they managed to occupy the hill of Shirayama outside of their base. As the samurai were forbidden by honor to surrender, a suicidal charge was led against Yamagata's imperial army, effectively bringing them to an end. All right, so let's return to the capital of Tokyo, the largest city in the world. One of my favorite features is the Tokyo Dome, but less the dome itself and more of what surrounds it. The Tokyo Dome City Amusement Park is home to the very first centerless Ferris wheel, or otherwise known as the Big O. The engineering geek in me loves this. Construction finished in 2003 by Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, and in 2008, karaoke machines were added to some of the gondolas. The country's largest roller coaster, Thunder Dolphin, passes through the ride's 60 meter center. Tokyo is so large that it's broken down into a bunch of special wards. Think of them as like smaller cities within the bigger city. One of them is Toshima City, which is home to the Toshima City Takiwasu Manga Museum. The entire city is kind of covered in this art style anyway, but you can visit this apartment, which is where the former masterminds that did a lot of anime and manga lived. 70% of Japan is mountainous, mostly due to the massive amount of tectonic plate activity. The highest peak is Mount Fuji on the island of Honshu at 3,776 meters, which overlooks Tokyo. This has kind of become a Japanese cultural icon and is depicted in a lot of the art. It's also considered an active volcano, last erupting about 300 years ago, so watch out. With that said, there is a pretty low risk of another eruption. However, the latest one did form another peak named Mount Hoi, halfway down its southeast side. Surrounding Mount Fuji, you can find what is known as the Fuji Five Lakes. All of these took formation from prior eruptions of Mount Fuji. All right, now bear with me on this one. They are Yamanakako, Kawaguchiko, Saiko, Shojiko, and Motosuko. Fuji Yoshida is the principal city, and this is built on hardened lava. 
Aokigahara, or the Sea of Trees, can be found along the northwestern side of Mount Fuji. This is also known as Suicide Forest. Kind of pairs well with the fact that it's said to be full of ghosts. Not eerie enough, because of the hardened lava rocks, much of the sound is absorbed, making it a great spot for solitude and sheer quiet. It also has several caves that fill completely with ice every winter. Japan has its own professional baseball league called Nippon Professional Baseball, which was founded in the mid-30s. It's not really played any differently than baseball in the U.S. or other areas of the world. However, the strike zones are noted to be rather narrow. Some of the teams include the Chunichi Dragons, Hiroshima Toyo Carp, and Tokyo Yakult Swallows. Ah, on the subject of sports, they also have a wrestling league, which is the NJPW, or the New Japan Pro Wrestling. They have a website and a fan club that you can join. So, I've mentioned Shintoism a few times now, but haven't really talked in depth about what that is. Essentially, it's a belief that that everything, and I mean literally everything, has spirituality or gods, which the word for that is kami. This kind of makes sense when you consider Japan's colorful culture and why it's everywhere, and while a lot of people don't really practice it in a religious sense today, it's still a very important part of the Japanese character. Now let's get back to the cities. We haven't really talked about Kyoto yet. Some may refer to this as the cultural capital as it's known for all of its Buddhist temples and shrines. Fushimi Inari is the oldest one from the 8th century founded by the Hata family, dedicated to the Shinto god Inari. Kyoto is also the capital of the country for about a thousand years, which is what gave it that cultural identity. Iya Valley can be found on the Shikoku Island, known for all of its vine bridges. These were built for daily travel in ancient times, but over the years, very few of them have remained intact. The ones that still stand are popular tourist spots, but be careful. Japan is very susceptible to tsunamis, which, by the way, that's a Japanese word. This goes back to what I was talking about earlier about the heavy tectonic plate activity. The entire country is situated where four massive ones meet, those being the Eurasian, Pacific, Philippine, and North American plates. What's often referred to as the Japanese hornet is actually called the Asian giant hornet, that being the biggest hornet in the world. An inch and a half in length and have a wingspan of up to three inches. Ooh, and the stinger is nearly a quarter inch long. While one sting isn't usually lethal, several can definitely be deadly to humans, even if you're not allergic. This is also what Americans gave the nickname murder hornets, just because a couple of them were found on the west coast back in 2020. Now, I kind of hinted at this at the top of the video, but it's not really much of a secret that there are a lot of Japanese companies within the U.S. Let's talk about a couple of them. Toyota was founded in 1937, initially a machining company called Toyota Industries. Nintendo goes way back to 1889, originating as a playing card business for several decades. And Sony hit the scenes in 1946 as a telecommunications corporation. There's an ethnic group called the Ainu that mostly reside in the northern parts of Japan. Many centuries ago, Japanese migrants would bring them under their control, and in 1875 they would be assimilated due to the Treaty of St. Petersburg. Because this treaty gave them automatic Japanese citizenship, they technically cannot be considered indigenous. Some of these northern islands actually cause a bit of a border dispute with Russia. While many of them have been occupied by Japanese since the colonization, Russia administers them, which dates back to World War II. Conflict like this existed even prior to World War II, specifically the Russo Japanese. Japanese War. This took place between the two empires from 1904 and 1905 over Manchuria and the Korean Peninsula, leading to the aforementioned expansion of Imperial Japan upon victory. Japan was also one of the few territories that the Mongol Empire could not conquer. After failing once, Kublai Khan would aim for Japanese shores again, but would be met with kamikaze or divine wind, which is where this term originates. Due partially to inferior Mongol boats, they were unable to withstand a typhoon that obliterated them, being proof to the Japanese that they were under the protection of heaven. However, more recently, Recent studies do mention that the Japanese just had incredible fighting strength, and some even suggest that the typhoon had nothing to do with this victory. Now, this isn't necessarily unique to Japan specifically, but Japan very much does have a problem with an aging population and overworking. There's actually a word for death by overworking called karoshi, and this is a problem that's kind of plagued the island since the 70s. One in five Japanese are actually at risk of this. The Jomon period existed between 14,000 and 300 BC, the word coming from the culture of the hunter-gatherer inhabitants of the time. This was discovered through carbon dated pottery when fragments were found categorized by their cord markings. In earlier periods, they were made by chipped stone tools and manufacturing pottery often implies evidence of a sedentary life. Japan is very much known for its blossoming cherry trees, most notably the Soma Yoshino, having a rich meaning in Japanese culture. A very well-known waterfall in Japan is the Nachi Falls. Though there does exist taller ones with multiple drops, it is the longest uninterrupted single drop fall in the country at 133 meters. Okinawa World is a theme park that focuses on Okinawan culture. Some of the main attractions include a craft village, snake museum, and a massive natural cave. The Gyoku Sendo Cave is nearly five kilometers long, being the second longest in the country. It's well lit and maintained as 850 meters of it are open to the public. And with 
with that, we conclude our deep dive within the Japanese borders. As I asked before, is there anything that I left out? I'd love to hear about it. Is there something that I got wrong? As always, feel free to leave some comments, and if you like this, give it a like. If not, give it a thumbs down. Thank you, as always, for sticking around for the entire video, and I will see you next time.